we're, we're already rolling. Let's 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 dive right in. And I want to officially thank you and welcome you to the program, Paul. It's 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 really great to meet you and chat with you. Thanks for having me, man. Fellow Lutheran, I see the familiar. The familiar, um, uh, God, it looks like a war bonds poster from the 40s. That Lutheran church thing in the background. I love that. I, I yeah. grew up like seeing that. I don't even really know what it evokes or, or tries to embody other than it's, uh, it's a nice piece of visual nostalgia for me. Yeah, so that's that's actually a sign from one of the churches that I served. Actually, so so I grew okay. up in Michigan, like you, but then yeah. I served churches in Texas and in New York City, and that's actually like an old school sign from the 1940s from the Lutheran Church that I served in New York City, and they let me steal it when I left to come to Texas. So yeah, well but, played, man. I, yeah, I have thanks, man. Friends with uh, I'm friends with an actor named MC Ganey. Do you know who that mm -hmm. is? No, no. MC Ganey's amazing. He he's in everything from like Lost. He played a villain in season one of Lost. He's in a, he's in Sideways, Con Air, a bunch of stuff. But yeah. he always takes a prop or a some visual piece from everything he's worked on, and uh, and you're you're doing a similar thing, man. Always always take a memento. That's smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so, answer me this, man. H how do you get from the middle of Michigan, where where I grew up and you grew up, out out to Hollywood? Like that's, th those things are not close. Those are, those I mean, are worlds and worlds apart. There's really only a c few ways to do it. I think most people do it the same way, but I mean, you can technically, there's like five ways. You can take, you can take a bus, you can take a train, you can fly, you can, obviously we drove cross country or you can walk, which I don't recommend because it's going to, it's going to take a long time. Is yeah. that what you meant? That's exactly what I meant. Thank you. I'm, I'm taking notes for my next trip. But like, you know, I, I grew up there, you grew up there. And my sense is like, like, like me, you grew up hanging around with your friends in Saginaw, Flint, yeah, that whole area. Around. We don't, we don't have anything like Hollywood. And no, that's, and, it's, it's another planet. But what was weird is we started to get Hollywoody stuff because of that tax incentive that was in place for maybe four years. I think from like 2007 to 2011, there was like <clears throat> a Michigan tax incentive where they tried to get filmmakers to come there. And they did get some big movies. Like there was a Will Ferrell basketball movie, semi-pro that came. Yep. There was a Sam Raimi, Wizard of Oz sequel called Oz the Great and Powerful or something. So there were these bigger movies coming there. And I, what I did is I showed up to be a background extra, like an, an actor, uh, what do they call it? Uh, an extra. Yeah, you, yeah. You've probably heard of that. <clears throat> and I just went to be an extra in a couple of Michigan movies. And I ended up getting cast in one of those movies. Weirdly enough, my faith would be a, a component of that where I, you know, the movie I first got, I did a movie called Virginia in 2009. I think it came out like two years later. But this movie had some big actors, Jennifer Connelly from A Beautiful Mind, Russell Crowe. I mean, like, or I'm sorry, not Russell Crowe, uh, Ed Harris, um, Emma Roberts, Eric Roberts' daughter, mm -hmm. Julie Roberts' niece, like really, really pretty good sized cast. And I just showed up to be an extra, but I saw the filmmaker there, this guy named Dustin Lance Black. Um, have you seen the movie Milk with Sean yeah. Penn? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he wrote that and won the Oscar for that. I saw him and hit and I said to him, I just go, hey, man, just want to say congrats on the Oscar. Loved milk, loved your speech. Um, congrats, man. Uh, that movie and the speech brought a tear to my eye. Just 30 second little, but it wasn't it wasn't to gain anything. I was just being genuine. It was more like the excitement and giddiness of meeting someone in Hollywood in my home you know, state. <clears throat> but he goes, what's your name? And I told him and he writes my name down and my like badge number. They gave all the extras like a little name tag with a number. Like it's so, it's so like, you know, PG prison camp at those things. It's very, it's, it's very like, it's a sad affair to walk into, you know, your greatest hope when you, when you try to be a background actor, your greatest hope is that they're like, we need someone who can play the tuba. And then you're like, I play the tuba. And they're like, you're in the movie. You know, that's the only way it usually ever happens. But this guy, 
saw something in me and gave me like the sixth biggest part in the movie. I was on set 10 days out of like, I think I had 10, 11 shoot days out of maybe 30. And I ended up like making friends for life with my co-stars. And like, I think I made like 10 grand or something. It was crazy. Um, It changed my whole life. And I, and in answer to your initial question, um, that's kind of how I got to Hollywood. I moved to LA after like a month after we filmed. And you said that was in 2000, 2009, 2010? Fall of 2009, yeah. And the movie, the, the experience was amazing. Like everyone was kind to me. Um, I got to bring family and friends to set all the time. It was like Entourage where you never saw me without three of my high school buddies or my brother or somebody. Uh, <clears throat> you know, very like, very sort of dreamlike is mm-hmm. the most honest depiction but of course the movie didn't do well. It, it famously did horrible. And, uh, and we, I think we made like five grand in theaters. We only opened up in like less than 10 theaters and it got buried and it really hurt me. Cause I was, you know, this guy just won an Oscar for the mo- last movie he wrote. And now he's writing, directing a movie I'm in. And I got Jennifer Connelly and Ed Harris. I'm thinking, Whoa, this is going to be a big Oscar movie. And so it was a good lesson for me to kind of, you know, I should have just been grateful and just kind of enjoyed it. And instead I kind of bloviated it into something it wasn't. And, uh, and, you know, I would learn that lesson again on Richard Jewell, the movie I did with Clint Eastwood, where I was just enjoying the ride. I just enjoyed it and was like really humbly grateful and quiet and chill and then people kind of get in your ear and they start telling you things you want to hear even when you don't ask for them and it and it changes perspective you know my buddy abby davis is a christian and uh and works in entertainment she's a producer we have a line we say to each other where you know because her she and i have a whole thing where you know we we used to go to church together and then you know hit her vape pen and and go get lunch and see a movie in Los Angeles. We called it Sunday fun day. Um, So she and I on our Sunday fun days, we'd always be saying like, why are we so ambitious and like sick in the head with wanting to be, be prominent and be recognized? Why can't we just enjoy the free shrimp? Mm. Cause like you go to a party and it's like, why aren't you just walking in going, wow, I'm eating shrimp and drinking a cocktail and I didn't pay for either. What? Like, how does it, how do we get so, how do we get so far away from that sort of childlike wonder and gratefulness? Mm-hmm. And, and so we've been fighting to get back there ever since yeah. of like getting back to the childlike wonder and no expectancy because expectancy is kind of like the, the fun killer. Yeah. Well, it, uh, it's interesting you that say was that, such Paul. A rant. I apologize. No, no, it's 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 good because it takes us right where a place where I wanted to go. Because one of the notes I I took in prepping for this conversation is one of the things I appreciate you in following you on social media and even just watching your work is that I do get a great sense of gratitude oh, from that's... you. I I do sense that that you are very very grateful. You feel very blessed to do this work. But what you're saying is that's something you've had to work on. Oh yeah, not not because I'm not grateful, but you do negate gratefulness and gratitude or whatever. You you negate it when you or overshadow it when you want so much more. And mm-hmm. it's it's not wrong from a place of like fun passion. If you have a passion in you that's like, oh, I passionately want to do a western someday and I want to direct a movie and I want to do a music video. Good. That's not bad. But when that takes over the narrative and and it's only about excelling and beating this checklist in your head it's like that's not a very in my opinion it's not a healthy way to live i'm always at my best when i'm you know the bible talks about this there's a verse that talks about when you go to a wedding banquet or some event you're supposed to sit in the back if somebody sees you in the back and is like why are you sitting in the back you should be at one of the head tables then you of course have humbled yourself which you should always do and then you get the spoils of someone deciding you belong somewhere else like awesome i i I have to remind myself of that because if too many good things happen you start to go 
well, this is just my life. Mm. Mm -hmm. I guess my life, I'm always eating lobster and drinking this expensive IPA and putting my feet on the chair. And it's like, no dummy. (laughs) That's not where you came from. You came from a place where your mom and dad had to pinch pennies and buy ghetto cereal because they were paying for private Christian school tuition. Yeah. which may or may not have been a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know some days, but uh, I'm grateful for my relationship with God. So I wouldn't really take it back. But but at the same time, that that always makes me laugh a little too. Well, well tell me more about that relationship with God. Like what role does your faith play in your really? art? And then then in your life as a as a now a now a, a recognizable actor, uh, what role does your faith play? I mean, God, God, I, I like, I, I also have to like, I, there's a church I attended in LA called Reality LA yeah. in Hollywood. And uh, I love the place. Jeremy Treat, their pastor, um, has been a very good mentor to me and friend at times uh, when I really needed him. Uh, but there was a pastor there who now started a church, a reality in London, Um his name escapes me. Really good looking guy wrote a book uh, that describes like every pastor. <laughs> um, but this, this guy said the term emotional modesty. He was doing a course on like dating and singleness. And, you know, there's a bunch of sad 26 year olds who, you know, don't want to admit to their porn addiction in the same room, essentially. Um, but the guy's like, the guy's telling us, he's like, you know, you have to, uh, you have to have emotional modesty. You can't tell everybody every part about yourself immediately because it literally scares people away. Um, so when I do these interviews and podcasts, sometimes I have to practice emotional modesty because I'm just like, I'm ready to spill my guts to anybody, whether it's the Pope or a homeless guy, but um, that might not be good. So for me, God, my relationship to God is, I, I need it. Even if it wasn't true, even if it wasn't true and there was no God, I would still do this to maintain civility and the fruits of the spirit Mm. to just be a good person because I am a sinner and I mess up and I suck a lot of Mm. times. Um, So there's that, but I do believe it's true and I do love, love Jesus. And that's a part of, a part of my personal growth. Forgive me. I have fruit flies in my apartment right now. I swear it's like the plague here, man. I've been in New Orleans for five months and I have battled spiritual warfare. We had, we had a bunch of production issues. We had a hurricane come through. I decided to just get sober randomly in the middle of the shoot and haven't had a drink in 50 days. We've had fruit flies in my trailer, fruit flies in my apartment. We had our air conditioning break. I got COVID um it's been crazy and mm-hmm. uh hashtag thank you god for sustaining mm-hmm. me amidst all this crazy um god, god is my source of growth he's um he's how i understand even pieces of the world and myself and then in my work i think i think my faith affects my work because you know on my best day i'm always like you know I, w- I want to be better. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and on my worst day, I am able to practice grace for myself. Yeah. So it works in both, both extremes and capacities, I think. And it shows me how to love people that I, that aren't always lovable. Yeah. You know, yeah. I think in our current world with the political climate, and I say political climate because outside of politics, you don't see this, mm-hmm. but everybody kind of hates each other, or at least they, they promote that vibe. And I kind of just like, I kind of look at the world right now and I wonder, is there selective empathy? You know, Mm -hmm. is everybody choosing to love a certain type and not everybody? Um, And I I didn't come up with selective empathy. I read an article and I, I stole that term, but, but I think, Jesus Christ allows me to have empathy for everybody and love everybody rather than join the torch brigade and just want to hate everybody for whatever random infraction they've committed this week. Uh, I I'm a screw up. I wouldn't want to be held to that same, 
that same, uh, you know, uh, standard, you know, yeah. so, that, so that's the long ranty way of explaining how God affects my daily life and my work life. Yeah. Well, you know, as a, as a pastor, I'm totally biased. I think it's gotta be essential to everything that you're doing. Right. You know, but, but, but I would think at the very least, you know, you know, the, the notion that the reality of, you know, the grace that comes to us through, through Jesus, uh, the notion, the reality of the grace that comes to us through Christ, it, it keeps us, um, it keeps us grateful, which you've said is important for the work that you do. Um, it keeps us grounded, which is important, I would think, for the world that you you live in, right? Uh, but but then also it gives us this notion, and this comes from that kind of Lutheran background that you share with me, of I am simultaneously two things. I am a a sinner, completely and utterly, but I'm also a saint in the eyes of God. So like my worth in the eyes of the Creator is set. Yet I get to still be brutally honest about my humanity and my brokenness and all yeah. my issues. Like I, I'm I'm free to be honest about that. Also, your issues don't surprise God. Like there's some lame thing they teach in church and schools where they tell kids all the time they're like your sins made the savior weep and then they hand you a freaking kleenex like there's so much guilt wrapped into faith uh in a lot of places not every place but a lot of them god's not dude god is not on the guilt train god's not like i want to guilt you into submission and believing in me mm -hmm. that's the lamest ungod thing ever yeah. god freaking loves you yeah only wants you to acknowledge sin because it's hurting you. God's in heaven. It's not like he's got one foot in our water and he's like, I'm still feeling the nails on the cross. No, dude, that is done. One and done, bro. Yeah. You don't make that kind of sacrifice so that it can echo into eternity. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, he's living out. He's living out the riches of his sacrifice too. It's not just us. So oh, that's a good point. That's a good you know, point let's not play mm -hmm. the game where God is watching us like the Truman show crying his eyes out all day. Not true, mm -hmm. but right. that is what is communicated quite often. So yeah. my, my, my thing with that is, you know, and, and once again, I'm getting a little tangential, but back to the point of, you know, it is a relationship. There, there are some celebrities I've met who claim to be believers in God or Jesus. And, and I talk with them and they don't go to church. And I used to look at it like, what, what, what is your deal that you don't go to church? I used to kind of judge that, but they live a different life where they've been hurt in unique ways and they've been ostracized in unique ways. And maybe their church is what we're doing now. Maybe it's on a laptop watching it on YouTube. Maybe that's their church. And I can't really judge that anymore. I used to think it was bad form, but you know, can, can, Jim Carrey walk into a church yeah. and be treated normal? Probably not. Yeah. Uh, I talked to an NFL quarterback who I won't say who it is, and I won't say who the person is, but I talked to an NFL quarterback who famously went to or attended a mega church, and I won't say which one and who, but the pastor there was kind of grabby and like kind of liked the flavor of celebrity. Yeah. And so that guy ended up feeling grossed out and didn't go to the church. Yeah. And so, you know, we got to be careful how we treat those people. Like there should be a, a calm equanimity to how we embrace everyone, uh, both in the church and out of the church. And I see that too on movie sets where mm. somebody treats a background extra or, a, or an assistant like crap. But then when Joe Schmo with the Oscar walks on, it's like, hey, man, uh, and everybody's like suddenly all over him. And it's like, dude, that is that is such bad form. Like, yeah. don't, don't you see that when someone treats a server poorly at a restaurant? Doesn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and the, the New Testament, the, the New Testament goes at great lengths to say, look, this, this thing that we believe is meant to actually break down all those things. I mean, so you, so you, so you look at like letters in the New Testament where it says uh, rich and poor, black, white, all these things, these, these, these things that we use to divide and subjugate, these don't exist in the kingdom of heaven, right? And so we should try to replicate that when people walk into the church, like we sit yeah. side by side, shoulder to shoulder, but that is such a difficult thing to actually live out, right? Or like, you know, like a homeless guy, like if you're sitting next to him, you know, on a bus or a subway, whatever, it's like, oh, he smells. Do you get up and leave? It's like, dude, if, if, Christ bore a crown of thorns. I think you can handle the scent of someone else for nine minutes in a bus. 
Like mm-hmm. there's just a lot of things we, and by the way, it's human. We all do it. Our reaction to pain is how do I immediately eradicate this? That's why we have extra strength Tylenol. It's mm-hmm. not because we were trying a new flavor of pill. It's because we want this to go away as soon as humanly possible. But that pain and that discomfort and that awkwardness is often God's will, literally. Mm -hmm. Uh, Not because he's poking at us like a voodoo doll. He's doing it because he's like, well, like anything, a lot of this is kind of practice for the scrimmage or the game, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, And if you didn't have that pain or those experiential moments, how are you supposed to navigate anything with thoughtful, wisdom-led authority? won't have it um by the way this this is fun just talking i feel like i'm talking to people i've known for years so like don't look at the clock cut it off i have nothing going on cut it off when you want to cut it off um i i'm not on a a time crunch here sounds good man well I'm, i'm having a good time too so so tell me this you know um you've been you've been acting in movies for for 11 12 years now it sounds like and and yet in the in the last five six years my, my sense of knowing your work a little bit is that things have really, really changed for you over the last five or six years with some really prominent roles. Yeah. Um, like the last four years. Uh, yeah. yeah. This time, literally this week, four years ago, I was at the Toronto film festival for the I Tanya premiere. And that mm-hmm. was a really neat moment because we didn't really know what we had. We kind of, it's kind of like, you know, Dr. Frankenstein and his monster. We made this weird thing in a basement that we thought was cool, but we didn't know if they were going to come with pitchforks or roses, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, very luckily we were embraced at that festival and, and we were right at the top of the heap with like three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri, that movie with Rockwell and McDormand. Yeah. Uh, like it was, it was a really crazy moment where I, you know, I was once again, free shrimp, right? Mm -hmm. I was just happy to be there. I wasn't expecting, I wasn't being cocky or icky. I was just really like tearfully grateful. I remember a moment walking into the Toronto Film Festival uh, hotel that I got. Cause once again, they didn't pay for my stuff. I was like putting myself up, uh, just wanted to be there, wanted to be a part of it, you know? And I go into my, uh, I go into, man, I'm getting goosebumps, man. I'm getting emotional thinking about it. There's a photo I took of my hotel room. I looked out the window and I did the classic, you know, I felt like Kevin McAllister in Home Alone 2. I'm I'm in New New York City. Oh my God. You know, I'm I'm peeling the blinds back and looking out the giant window of my high rise. And the word dream is etched Mm -hmm. on a building like next door to the building I'm in. And it just felt like a wave from God, just Mm -hmm. a little like poke and a wave like, hey, buddy, I know how hard you've worked. This is this is one of those moments you get to have one of these moments. And I was sober that weekend, too. I didn't drink a lick of anything. I kept a Canada dry can from that weekend because I was so proud of myself. But I had like the one of the greatest weekends of my life. And that movie really allowed everybody to see what I can do. And, and I'm so grateful that it's a fun little calling card that led to a lot of other things. Yeah. But, but all the things it's led to have been really incredible. Of course, you know, R- Richard Jewell and uh, m- m- one of my favorites, Cobra Kai and a whole bunch of other things. Um, and, you know, a new movie right now called Queen Pins where you're working with Vince yeah. Vaughn. You get to do comedy alongside Vince Vaughn. But, but all, all of that when that first all that wave starts to come and your life, I would imagine really starts to, to change in some substantive ways, it, that has to be disorienting, right? Um, when, when, when suddenly you're recognized in places and you're working alongside people you haven't been able to work alongside before, is that, it, or maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Is it not disorienting? I'm assuming it would, like it kind of turns everything out upside down. Disorienting is a really good word. I don't think the disorienting part happened until Richard Jewell. Everything before that was like, this is where I should be. I should be the husky character actor who jumps into a courtroom drama and jumps out to do a sitcom. Like, I always thought that was who I was going to be as an actor. And a lot of my favorite actors did that. Like, 
like John Goodman. John Goodman was like working with the Coen brothers while doing Roseanne. Mm -hmm. um, I knew I could do that. I wanted to do that. And that was exactly what I was doing around that time. What I didn't really think would happen is getting a phone call saying Clint Eastwood wants you to star in his movie. That, that was like, well, once again, I've told the story a million times and I'll just give the, the beat points really quickly, which are, Oh God, it's so crazy. By the way, I say God now. I don't say Jesus Christ is a curse word, but now I say God all the time because I realize it's really just an exhalation that points to God because of some moment of strife or just grateful disbelief. Hmm. Uh, so I, I've taken the, <laughs> the childhood guilt out of saying, oh God, or God, or oh my God. Oh man, I'm the son of a pastor too. My brother is a sixth generation Lutheran pastor. Is he really? He resides in Michigan. So it's it the roots are deep as thick as they could be, man. Yeah. They're real thick. Um, so it's funny how I have to undo little structural things that my brain thought was were concrete growing up. It's it's humorous if it wasn't so consequential to those who are afraid of those things. Um what the hell were we talking about? I'm so sorry. No, I, I was I was asking you about how once oh, fame once fame really has how like how disorienting, disorienting it is. It? Yeah, disorienting. Good word. So, uh, what is disorienting is when the person who doesn't text you anymore decides to start texting you. Uh, what's disorienting is when a beautiful woman who ghosted me um, is inviting me to a party all of a sudden. What's disorienting is when what's disorienting is when you, you you're suddenly believing things that are crazy and then you find out they're not crazy and they're real. Like some huge director who makes blockbuster movies offering me three quarters of a million dollars to star in their new, you know, space epic or something. That those things started to happen and it was exciting, but it was also a lot at once and you didn't know who to trust. I yeah. still don't know who to trust. There are yeah. still moments where I give somebody a chance, they prove untrustworthy, and then I'm the one slowly ghosting them. And it's not because I hate them, but it's because life is short. I have a demanding schedule, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and, and I can't handle those things yeah. sometimes. You know, and th that part is disorienting, I would say. But but the work itself, you know, that's the joy. Everything outside of the work that can be really frustrating. You know, that can that can be tough. So so, what role did your faith oh, play? Uh, in, in you, all, you, also, yeah. you also said like getting recognized. Yeah. That stuff is fun, man. That like I'm into it. When somebody wants to take a photo or they get emotional and they tell me that they saw Richard Jewell with their grandmother. It's the last movie they saw in theaters or they're like, that stuff is awesome. Um, and even if I'm busy and I'm headed somewhere and someone tries to stop me at the very least, I'll always try to make them feel seen. Uh, Cause we all want that. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Is that when some gratitude kicks in? Do you, do you feel gratitude when it's like, does that make the, Oh, I'm blessed to do this. Does that always. make that come yeah, to life? I'll retweet somebody and just say, thanks for watching my movie. Cause I'm like, dude, there's a billion movies in existence. You don't have yeah. to go see Queen Pins. If yeah. you do, it means a lot to me. It's cool. Yeah. And you know, you know, coming from where you, you came from, and, and like we mentioned earlier, you and I are from the same part of the world. If someone who's in, a, who's in movies that you watch and TV shows that you watch does something as simple as like your tweet when you live in Saginaw, Michigan, oh, that's like the most important thing that's ever happened to you. Bro, I want to I wanna immediately tell a story based on what you just said. And I'm so grateful you said it because... I haven't told this story yet. I don't think I, man, this is so messed up. I played a mortgage banker in a movie called Adam that we shot in Detroit at one reverse mortgage in Quicken Loans buildings in Detroit. It's me, Jeff Daniels, Aaron Paul, great cast. The movie's just meh, but, um, but great people tried to make a good movie. Um, I filmed that playing a mortgage banker six months later, 
I'm working in Saginaw at a bowling alley and a butcher shop. And I'm like living with my parents. Hmm. So the LA thing, I only lived in LA for a year. The, the year I moved out, I ran out of money. I was sleeping on someone's floor. I was depressed. It was bad. I go home to Michigan. I work some menial day jobs at a grocery store in a bowling alley. Eventually I'm not making up, I'm not making enough money to save, to move back to LA, which was the whole point of working like these jobs. So I moved down to Detroit to become a mortgage banker. I literally got a job as an associate mortgage banker at the place I played a mortgage bank <laughs> a year after a year and a half after I shot it. You can't write that. I mean, you can, but it it's wild. Yeah. So the whole point of me saying that, because what, what did you say to, to kickstart this? It no, just be, like being in the middle of Michigan and somebody in Hollywood likes right. a tweet. Thank you. So the whole point of me telling that weird story is while I was working as a mortgage banker uh, at Quicken Loans in Detroit, I was tweeting one day. Um, I was really sad. This guy, Jack Gilbert, who is an exec or a script consultant at Warner Brothers, a Christian dude who taught taught me some stuff at a conference once, a workshop. He died and I was depressed. And I found a song by Loudon Wainwright, this, this folk musician. And I loved the song so much and it was kind of cheering me up. And I remember that I only knew of Loudon Wainwright because of the Judd Apatow movie, Knocked Up. That was the first time I heard the guy's music. So I just thanked Judd and said, you know, Loudon Wainwright, this music is really cheering me up today. And Judd like liked it or retweeted it. And it made such an impact on me mm -hmm. because I was, not because it meant anything, it was just him clicking twice or whatever. Yeah. But it meant something to me because I was sad and depressed. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, if I can click something and it makes somebody happy for a couple hours, awesome. I hope yeah. so. Um, and now, like, I've taken a meeting with Judd Apatow. I've been to his office. Him and his wife are fans of Richard Jewell. So, Wait, like, you, you've, you've sat down with, with Judd and Leslie? Leslie wasn't there, but Judd made a big stink that... I think he said she paused the movie during the movie and just said, like, did you see what Paul just did? Did you see the thing he just did or what? Like, I don't know. How cool is that? Yeah. Leslie Mann is like amazing, right? I mean, Judd's fantastic, but Leslie Mann is an incredible actress. By the way, does anyone does anyone do comedy anger better than Leslie Mann? No, mm -mm, no, probably not. No, probably not. Her and Don Rickles, maybe. I don't know. I think they're brilliant. And like, it's hard to, it's not hard. It's, it's confounding when I look back at the fact that I was such a fan of Sam Rockwell still am obviously, but I mean, like I would do interviews back in 2015 and every interview I'd bring up Sam Rockwell and be like, my favorite actors are Peter, Peter Sarsgaard, Sam Rockwell, Michael Shannon. I'd list like five guys. The fact that I did a Clint Eastwood movie with him is crazy. Yeah. It's it'll never not be crazy to me. Right. Well, like, and, and I'll never get over that. And just to bring that up, like my, my favorite moment in that in that movie. And, and I think one of my favorite like actor moments that I've ever witnessed is in the in the scene where you're sitting in the restaurant with Sam Rockwell toward the end. And uh, Don Draper comes over and he hands you <laughs> he hands you the letter that says the case is over. And, yeah. and 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 then Sam Rockwell looks at you as Richard Jewell. And, and says to Richard, um, it's over. And your, your choice to just kind of take a beat and let it hit you, and then you take a bite of the donut before a word is said, was just so real and powerful, man. Was that, was, was that bite of the donut in the script, or was that just a, like a choice you made in that moment? I made that choice while reading the script weeks before I shot it. Yeah. Once again, it pays to be a consumer of the thing you create. Mm -hmm. So there are some choices I make sometimes and they aren't, I, uh, people can define it however they want. I, I sometimes get a little nauseated by people giving me too much credit. Um, but I, I will say like, being a consumer of movies in that moment, I was thinking if I'm an audience member, what does that moment mean for me? 
And for me, I'm watching the movie. I'm seeing this guy get crapped on for 90 minutes, two hours. And like, you're almost teasing the audience by not crying right away. Yeah. yeah. You're kind of holding it in. And, you know, Michael Caine famously said, good film crying is trying not to cry. Yeah. So I took those two methodology ideologies and just thought, well, he's not trying to cry in front of another grown man in a public setting. Yep. Nobody wants to do that. Yep. Um, I'm eating the donut in that moment because it's me going, oh, I can, I can enjoy myself again. Mm. Or like I'm free. This is a freedom based choice. Yep. So you take, so you taking the bite is a choice of just, I'm happy. I'm, I have freedom. But then when you start to chew and you're eating it, yep. you're tasting it. And tasting it is different than picking it up. We all know that. And and tasting it and chewing it and swallowing it is a is a different kind of freedom. So it's feeling all the micro emotions that would lead to that. And then on top of it, in between takes, I'm listening to Jerry Goldsmith's uh, musical score of the movie Rudy. And I'm mm. remembering like Paul, not Richard. Paul used to watch Rudy and dream about being a lead actor in a dramatic film. And here I am doing it. And, um, whew, sorry, I gotta, I gotta pull back a little bit. It's emotional. It's emotional thinking about it again, because I can put myself back in that booth and feel everything yeah. like it happened this morning. Yeah. Uh, and then Rockwell, who's one of my favorite actors, is sitting right across from me. So like, it's not hard to conjure emotion yeah. when you put that many deep-seated feelings in one pot and bring it to a boil. Yeah. Um, so really, I, I never went to acting school. I'm not trained classically. There are days I wish I was. <laughs> and I think like, what the, maybe I should have went to, you know, I don't know, Carnegie Mellon or something. I probably couldn't get into any of those schools anyway, so it probably doesn't matter. I still would have been at like the, you know, the Clio Playhouse outside of Saginaw or something. But but I say all this to say, you know, I'm not classically trained, but we all, anyone can act. It doesn't mean we have the versatility to be Daniel Day or, or Glenn Close, but everybody can act because we all feel feelings, man. Yeah. That's at the end of the day, that's all it is. Can you replicate a feeling honestly? And in that moment, between the score of Rudy looking at Rockwell, meditating on my journey, and then meditating on Richard's journey, yeah, easy to do at that point. It's well, not even attributable to talent, it's just attributable to emotional cognizance. Yeah, well, what made that moment real is that it was a real moment for you and the, the camera caught it, right? And then, but, but that choice to let silence speak for that moment and we watch you feel those feelings, just let the, the silence spoke louder than anything you could have done. You just paused, you took that bite, you took that beat, and then we watched the tears well in your eyes and, and like the viewer is just with you and they're done. So, you know, it was, it was, it was way, a great moment. Everybody tries to attribute this to the devil. I'm taking it back for, for JC. There, there you uh, go. This is, <laughs> this is now ours. The devil doesn't get that. This is rock and roll. And in the words of the famous Christian band Petra, God gave rock and roll to you, gave rock and roll to me, put it in the soul of everyone. Take it That's back. right. That's right. So, so Paul, you know, you, you strike me as, as someone who, um, you know, you, you have a, a steady head on your shoulders. You, you're grounded in your faith. And, and I know you're human like the rest of us, but What's it like, though, you have this, you know, grounding in your faith and a good head on your shoulders. What's it like meeting some of these famous people that you never thought you'd meet when you were growing up? Do you do you still get I mean, now a handful of years into this where you've worked with like everybody who's big in the world, do you still get moments where you're like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe that this person is standing right next to me. Does that happen? Oh, sure. Yeah, I think I think I've gotten better at not looking at it like that because, yeah. you know, it's it's like what Tarantino said in Pulp Fiction, you know, Travolta and Thurman sit down to that meal in the fifties diner. And Travolta says, it's like a wax museum with a pulse. 
it's a brilliant, brilliant line of dialogue. And, and it also describes some of these parties you go to, you know, I've been to, <laughs> this is not a good way to deal with it. Once again, I'm just being honest. I have nothing to lose really. Um, there was a party at CAA, the agency I, I am represented by. And I was, I usually bring a buddy. I always have like a buddy, uh, a female friend, a family member, whatever, come to these events. Cause, cause it's fun to bring somebody to have someone to socialize with and to have someone get to experience the fun of it. Cause it does get old for some of us uh, and it gets a little less glitzy, but for someone who doesn't live that lifestyle, they they're like, you know, eating baklava and drinking, you know, a $30 shot and talking to the producer of the revenant, you know, it's a fun night for somebody. But I had a night where I didn't go with anybody and I was like kind of lonely and didn't really want to go, but knew I should go and socialize and make a thing of it. So I, I just, cause I've been to those parties where nobody talks to you and then you feel like a, a freshman at a senior party and it's the worst. So I took, I took an edible and went to one of these parties and, um, and it was fun at the beginning and I'm just kind of walking around and I had like this good vibe on where I was very much just kind of loose and happy. And then at some point the edibles took a turn and I was terrified and I had like Todd Phillips and James Corden talking to me and I go, guys, I cannot talk to you right now. I am a little too high and need to need to leave the conversation. And like, I'm like grubbing and eating like cocktail wieners in the corner of this party and then just ordered an Uber and was like, I can't do it. This is bad. So I say all that to say that's the bad version of one of those nights. The good version is yeah, good and bad. But the good version is I, I went to another party around the same time frame where I went with my buddy, Abigail Spencer, who is a fellow believer as well. And we had a fun night where we like, I didn't drink. I didn't have to take any substances. I just went and I had so much fun just having really clarified conversations with people where I could be a better listener to them and I could make it about them and not make it about me. And those conversations, I really, you know, when I say conversations, I mean, like, I'm talking to DiCaprio, Chris Evans, Scarlett Johansson, Shia LaBeouf, Josh, like, I'm talking to all these people. Yeah. And we're having real human conversations rather than we're both a little buzzed surface level yeah. congratulatory crap. Yeah. And, and that stuff I love, you know, I love saying to Scarlett Johansson and Colin Jost, what can I pray for? Give me something I can, can pray. And by the way, all these people immediately give me something to pray for, right. you know, like, like, you know, Bradley Cooper and I had a really nice moment where we both got to tell each other that we were going to hold each other accountable and pray for something for each other. And we have, I haven't seen them in years, but like, uh, I know we're still praying for each other. Like mm -hmm. that, that's stuff like that is really, it means a lot to me. So I think, you know, there are times where those, those encounters and those events can be kind of treacherous and you either don't go or you go and you have a drink in your hand the whole night. And then other times it can be really, really kind of fun ways to, to love other people and try to minister to people that feel like crap. And, you know, even though they look, they're dressed to the nines and they look amazing. We're all hurting, man. Yeah. We're all hurting. Yeah. We all need people to ask us how we're doing and to pray for us or to, to vent with us and, and sit in that moment. We all need that. Yeah. There's this sense that, that Hollywood is a place that's not really amenable to people of faith. But what you're saying is that you've been able to be pretty open about the things that you believe and you found that there's a lot of kinship there. Yeah, there's that, that statement isn't true at all. That's a divisive political thing that people try to mandate as if Hollywood hates Christianity and doesn't love outsiders. Hollywood is the home of outsiders. Hollywood wants to love on everybody, but it's how you approach it. If you come from some hierarchical, aggressive place, if that's where you come from in the tonality of your representation of faith, who the hell would, who would want to embrace that? Hmm. It's like the people, you know, 
back when my buddy Evan Chisholm turned 21 and we, you know, scoured the streets of East Lansing on his 21st birthday in a, in a, I think we got a limo with his parents and it was like some celebratory thing. We're going in and out of bars and there's people with signs that say, you know, so-and-so or is going to hell and they list off gay people. And it's like, dude, even if you believe that, do you actually think that that's, even if you believe that, do you think that that's an appropriate way in which to get your point across or to gain favor from anyone? Mm -hmm. You're a lunatic if you believe that. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I just think that at the end of the day, how you treat people will be your gravestone. That'll be your resume. That'll be your farewell. How you treat people. It doesn't matter if you're a Muslim. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian. It doesn't matter if you believe in crunchy peanut butter. If you treat people like crap, there's your legacy. Yeah. So I, I, I've been very fortunate where the times I've shared my faith with everyone from an A-lister to a guy swinging a hammer on a TV set, they're embracive of me, not because they believe in everything I believe in, but because I'm trying to respect them and love them. Hmm. Isn't yeah. that what we all want? I yeah. mean, well, it's like what I, I loved your point that you know, in the end, how you how you treat people is is what your legacy is going to be. You know, one it made me think of what what Tim Keller says that the greatest proof of what you believe is how it causes you to treat other people. You know, the the, the greatest apologetic for the trustworthiness and the truth of you know, the, uh, the theology you stand on or stand behind is how it, how it leads you to treat people. Right. Um, yeah, man. And, and like, let's, let's even bring it out of the faith element and talk. Cause I, I think that parables and uh, metaphors are the greatest way to get through to people. Cause, cause we're human and we need to see things in a different context sometimes, same lens, different environment. So Christians have a thing where, because of the gospel, we feel compelled to share it, which is understandable. It's amazing. The scandal of grace is a big deal. But if I just learned how to use a slap chop or a food ninja or a, a blender or an easy bake oven, I'm going to go around being like, holy crap, <laughs> this is how you make homemade salsa give me 10 minutes of your time you'll never be the same <laughs> christians are wonderful people but they're at their most fallible when they feel that they've graduated from the class mm. a lot of us feel like we are chefs because we learned how to use a blender it's very cute but it's also wayward mm. we haven't graduated from four years of la cordon bleu in france so we need to we need to do this thing where, you know, people are so afraid of faith journey because they feel like, what if you go on a detour and you lose your way? What if you lose the breadcrumbs? Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen. What does God say? Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Mm -hmm. Light, nor death, nor angels, nor demons, nor... If you read that, then don't be so afraid to talk to your friend who does tarot cards. Don't be so afraid to watch mm -hmm. a rated R movie. Nothing can separate you. You are learning as a human. You're learning. Now, if you're delighting in something horrific, don't do it, obviously. Yeah. You have discernment as a person. Yeah. But as far as the experience, you are gaining experience in the world to inform your faith journey and to make you better at being that person. So it's not about capturing the hearts and going, I told 10 people about Jesus today. It should be, did your food taste so good that these people are go coming back and asking, what is the recipe? Hmm. You don't want them asking for the food. You want them asking for the recipe. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great way to put it. How did you get this? How did you make this? What's the secret? Oh, I got it. It's this grace that never runs out. That is free and for everybody and for you. Right. And, and, and let them come to you, man, because yeah. who, who likes the pamphlet in the door? Right. You know, I put my gum between those pamphlets. Right. I mean, because by the way, if someone's saved from a pamphlet or a 1 800 number on a public access station, good. That just proves the gospel is even stronger than we know. Mm -hmm. But more than likely, it's going to come out of relationship and you living out the fruits of the spirit. Mm -hmm. That if somebody 
is drinking that fruits of the spirit smoothie, they go, I got to know what's in this. Yeah. Well, like you said earlier, you know, no one gets guilted or shamed into doing anything, at least not for very long, right? What, what motivates people to change, what motivates people to believe is love. You know, I, I can scream at my kids and, and demand obedience and I might get, at best, I will get dismayed, frustrated obedience for a while, at best, but I won't get love. I won't get uh, a desire to, to walk in line with the will of dad. Uh, I won't get a, d a greater depth of our connection. I won't get that. Only love can do that. Only love can do that. And if you come <clears throat> 100% and if you come at it from a place of fear, yeah. If that's the entry point, which, you know, I don't know much about Catholicism, but it sure seems like they're for a lot of lapsed Catholics, their biggest gripe is that they were brought into faith by way of fear and not love. Mm. Yeah. And and in and sort of stern, borderline aggressive instruction rather than an invite to some sort of spirited faith-based intellectualism which is what it should be at the end of the day like we should never stop reading the word of god we should never stop opening our friend circle to different kinds of people because you are you never graduate you never graduate from wisdom it only sharpens or redefines yeah. so yeah. to me that's the journey and that's also why am, am i a proud believer in jesus christ hell yeah Am I going to promulgate it as if I have all the answers and can fix people? No, because I have a stain on my sweatshirt and fruit flies in my face and COVID and my bank account goes up and down and I, I can't keep a relationship together and I sin and I get arrogant and I get forgetful. And I, why, why would I be a teacher of the very why would I try to be a pharmacist of the pill I'm taking? Mm -hmm. um, it's just very, very obvious that we need brothers and sisters to link arms more than we need teachers to tell us what to do. Right, right, absolutely. To me, that's obvious. Absolutely. So, so Paul, tell us, what are you working on now? What are you excited about? Two questions, two separate answers. Um, I'm excited. Um, I'm excited to be done with this shoot. It's been a long shoot. I'm playing a serial killer for a limited series. It's a true crime, true story based on the murders of a guy named Larry Hall, who I believe is locked up in North Carolina or South Carolina. Um, he was a serial killer. He admitted to, I think maybe a dozen or 14 murders and, and some of them, involved rape um of these young women but he may have done upwards of 20 30 40 of these they don't actually know because he's been very revisionist history on the whole thing he's been very misleading and and crazy regarding his accounts but i play that guy and taron edgerton plays the sort of you know the like dicaprio and the departed Taryn is the character who factually this guy who got placed in that prison to get a forced confession out of my character, my guy. Uh, so that will be on Apple plus, I think spring of next year, hopefully. And, you know, it sounds like a dark story that a lot of your viewers and listeners might not want to watch, but the reality is, you know, the Bible is the most R-rated book in history. Beheadings, incest, uh, people killed for reasons that are seemingly unexplainable. So let's all calm down and get off our high horse. True crime is dope. Everybody loves true crime. Some sick part of us is fascinated by it. And then the other human part of us is just, we want to know if it's redemptive or if it ends uh, the way of the world. And I think, you know, our story has both gloomy irredemptive parts and beautiful legitimate redemptive parts and that's life so i'm really proud to portray that um it's been a pain in the ass to do because it's taken a long time but i'm very grateful for the job and i couldn't ask for a better dance partner karen edgerton is like i mean watch kingsman watch eddie the eagle watch um 
Rocket Man, I mean, the guy is clearly one of the next great, great actors, uh, similar to Leo. Leo had that run between like What's Eating Gilbert Grape and Catch Me If You Can. I think Taron's right in the middle of that run where he's doing his Romeo and Juliet and the beach and, you know, uh, and Man with the Iron Mask, Catch Me If You Can. He's in that pocket of doing really meaningful leading man work as a young guy. So I'm happy for him and, you know, happy for me. I'm getting to, it's actor candy. Every actor wants to play a serial killer or a, a druggy, something where you have to immerse and do something icky because it, it's fascinating, you know, it's, it's interesting. And tell us just a little bit before we let you go, tell us a little bit about Queen Pins. This is your movie out right hey, now. What a fun movie. Yeah. Kristen Bell, America's, her and Dak Shepard are like America's sweethearts, man. Uh, they are. By the way, another reason I think people take to me sometimes is similar to Kristen and Dax. They don't hide their flaws. They're very right. transparent. They're very open with the public. And they work really hard to entertain and, and love people. And I try to do the same. So I was thrilled to work with her, even in a small capacity. I think we only have one or two scenes together. Um, Kirby Howell Baptiste, who I worked with in Cruella, is also yeah. in Queen Pins. Yeah. And she is just, she, I think she maybe steals the movie. I mean, for me, she made me laugh more than me, Kristen, or Vince. Uh, and then Vince Vaughn is, of course, one of my comedy heroes. I've gotten to become friends with him through Sam Rockwell. Rockwell, Rockwell hit me up back in like, it was right before COVID. I think it was like December of 2019. Rockwell hit me up and was like, do you want to go to Bill Burr's Christmas party with me and Vince Vaughn? And I was like, I don't know. Do I have a terminal illness? Cause that sounds like a make a wish. Um, so I became friends with Vince through Sam and was very grateful to meet him. And uh, they didn't have that role cast when they cast me. And I said to them, they were talking about some like 50, 60 year old action stars to play that guy. And I was like, you know, it's a comedy. What if we go with like someone more comedically inclined? What about Vince Vaughn? And they go, Vince would be great. Do you know him? And I go, I sure do. So like, I think in front of them that day at the restaurant in front of the filmmakers, I literally texted the PDF script copy to Vince and three, four months later he was attached. So I, I felt like a mini producer bringing Vince into the fold and elevating the movie and and here we are, you know, a year and a half later or whatever it's been. And, and I hope people watch it. I really love playing the character, uh, the LPO, the loss prevention officer, Ken Miller. He's kind of a stickler for the rules and is kind of a, a kind of pencil pusher, you know, uh, would, would have been much more popular in the 1950s type, similar to Richard Jewell probably. Yeah. But uh, I love that guy deeply. And I think, you know, He's a composite of a lot of well-meaning people who sometimes have disastrous execution. Yeah, so yeah. happy to play him. I'll probably be playing that type the rest of my life. And, uh, and I think it's funny, you know, I improvised like a dozen lines that made it into the film and I always get a kick out of that. You know, I think, I think, I think it's like an inside joke with myself almost yeah. where I'll say something on the day that I'll make up and it makes it into the movie. I always get a kick out of that. So I really hope people see the movie Super proud of that. And then I got another movie coming out called Dealey is Gone. It's kind of a dark character study uh, starring me, Marissa Tomei, and Stefan James, who was the lead in, uh, he played in If Beale Street Could Talk, the Barry Jenkins film, and Homecoming, that, that show with uh, Julia Roberts, yeah. who was the lead of that. So I hope people check those out. That'd be Wonderful. nice. Wonderful. Well, Paul, you've been incredibly generous with your time. Thank you for thank you for joining us on the show today. Let's make a deal. If you're still doing this, if you're still doing this podcast, and I win like my first trophy or award or something, within like 48 hours, we'll do, we'll do another podcast, and we'll and we'll have like a little celebration where we can uh, we can thank God for how far He's brought me on this journey. That is a deal. Amen. Let's make it happen. And uh, I guarantee you, I, I, I don't think it's going to be too long until that day comes. But when, hey, ho however, however long it takes, man, we're going to keep doing this show just because of that. All right.
Well, I'm sending you, you got my email. I just put it in the Zoom chat and uh, and hit me up when that day comes. A giant, you're going to have to put like in giant caps. Yo, got it. Daddy, Daddy Pops <laughs> is back for round two. Rachel's ready to go. And uh, I'll sit in bed with a, with a sweaty tuxedo and a, a drink in my hand and a trophy. And we'll give God all the glory, right? I mean, that's who to give it to, man. Uh, I've, it's, it's what McConaughey said when he won the Oscar. Too many things have happened that are not by my hand or the hand of anyone else. And I don't say that to be cute. I don't say it to try to construct humility. But when you get a phone call, when you're sitting in your underwear in a hotel in Thailand and your agent calls you and goes, Clint Eastwood would like you to be the lead of his next film. That's not me, dude. (laughs) That's not me. That's right, man. From Saginaw, Michigan to a Clint Eastwood movie. Hey, man, thank you. Thank you so much for the time. And uh, we really appreciate it. Look forward to the next time we can chat. Well, lucky man. Thanks for making me feel cool. Love you guys. Peace. Mm -hmm.